Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we, we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we have here this morning to open your word together. And we invite your spirit's presence into our heart and into our lives and into this study. We pray, Lord, for those that are searching for truth, that you can guide and direct them. And we ask, Lord, that as we look at these things, that you can direct us on the right path. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so where we left off yesterday, we were looking at um, uh, Esther chapter 2. Um, so we were trying to address... Um, this chronology relating to Esther being crowned the Persian campaign against Greece, which is in the sixth year, and then Esther's crowned in the 10th month in the seventh year. And then we're going to have this decree in the 12th month. And, uh, and then we just looked right at the end there. We were talking about Esther's decree. So, um, uh, so addressing this chronology, a little bit. I'm going to uh, bring this up here. So I'll show you what, what I'm looking at. <clears throat> okay, so we have um, in 483, uh, that's going to be. So this is going to be the feast in chapter one, the last day of the feast. And bring it to, okay. So one of the things you'll see here, um, this is 483. So I'm just gonna go back a little bit to chapter one. So we remember that they have this Akitu festival in the spring. And if we look at, um, 483 BC. Hopefully people can see this. I'll make it a little bit bigger. So we have Nissan 1 here. Notice that Nissan 1 is the same on the Babylonian calendar, right? So they both have Nissan 1 as uh, the uh, first day of the first month. Now on the biblical calendar, when we get to the 10th day of the seventh month, Um, if I just I'll save that date there, you can see that, um, and I have here the 10th day of the seventh month and the 11th day of the seventh month, which is the 10th day of the seventh month here. So if I move this one day ahead, you can see this is the Babylonian calendar. So the 10th day of the seventh month uh, is a Sunday on the Babylonian calendar. You can see here it's a Sunday. It's the 11th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. And that's because the biblical calendar is always going to count uh, 3029, 3029, 3029, where the Babylonian calendar, they're going to observe uh, the months. At least that's what's believed, that they observe each lunar month. Now, it is possible that that's not the case. So there is disagreement among uh, scholars, though the vast majority of scholars would just say they observe the, the moon every month. We don't know that for certain in every specific time. It could be that they had a set time just like the Jews did for the months. Um, anyway, you can see that uh, if you started on the first day of the first month on uh, the Babylonian calendar, the 187th day, because there's 180 days, so the 187th day would be Tishri to nine, right? So my view, just to correct what we were talking about yesterday when we were looking at that, is that this would be the correct day. It would have been a Sabbath. It was the 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. But it's the 187th day of the year. 
So it would be the ninth day of the seventh month on the Babylonian calendar. So it would be the Saturday, not the Sunday. Right. Because if you if you took it as the 10th day of the seventh month, the feast would have lasted 180 days plus eight days. Does that make sense to people what I'm saying here? So they're going to start on the same date. But in that year, the Babylonian calendar, if they observe the months, by, by observing the months, by observing the lunar month, the new moon, um, 187 days would have ended on the ninth day of the, the seventh month, right? as you can see here. So that's this date. So if it was, so it'd have to be the 10th day a month on the biblical calendar, but not on the Babylonian calendar. <clears throat> Is that clear to people, or do I need to explain it in some other way? Anybody not understand what I just did? Babylonians on the first day of the week, Sunday. Well, the thing is, uh, so again, if we go back to Nisan 1, right? In 483 BC. So this is that year in which Vashti, this is the date that Vashti uh, is called but doesn't come, right? So if we look at Nisan 1, we can see on the Babylonian calendar here, it's going to be the same date. It's going to be April 9th on the Gregorian and April 14th on the Julian. So they're in agreement for that month. If I go month by month, you'll see that it's the next month, that is the month Nisan, according to the Babylonian calendar, only had 29 days. So when you go to the first day of the second month on the biblical, they're going to be on the second day of the second month on the Babylonian, right? So the Babylonian calendar isn't perfectly in line with the biblical. So when I say that when, when they do the count, they're counting from the first day of the first month. That's going to be day number one, and they have a feast for 180 days. So if you uh, we go back here, to the first day of the first month, 180-day feast would be 179 days as a cardinal count, right? So that means that if we go here, we can see... Uh, the 180 days are going to be Tishri 3 here, and they're going to be Tishri, Tishri 2, 2 here. So then you would count uh, the remaining seven days, right? So there you would just have to add seven days. And that would bring you to the 10th day of the seventh month. And uh, here would bring you to the ninth day of the seventh month. That would bring you to this date. So it was on a Sabbath. If we count 187 days, 187 days followed by the seven days. Now, on the Babylonian calendar, it would just say it's the ninth day of the seventh month. But it would still be, biblically speaking, the tenth day of the seventh month. It's just count. We're just counting the days from the first day of the first month to... Uh, to the feast. And so that brings us to, on the biblical calendar, the 10th day of the seventh month. Does that make, make sense to people? Yeah, it's pretty simple. It just counts. <laughs> right. So we're just counting, right? So, so it happens to be the 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. It doesn't tell us in Esther 1 what date it is. It just gives us a count. And that count would have begun on the first day of the first month. Because now he has this new year, that's when he's going to begin it. Now, there is an assumption there that, that he's actually going to begin on the first day of the first month. But we do know from uh, the Jewish tradition that this was on a Sabbath that it's occurred. Now, it is possible, you know, they started on the eighth day of the first month, and this is not going to be the tenth day of the seventh month. It's going to be... Um, the 17th day of the seventh month. 
right, on the biblical calendar. It's possible. But but it is on a Sabbath. And so the idea, too, is that they're going to, uh, you know, have this seven days of the feast. The seventh day there is going to be the Sabbath um, when Vashti is called up. We still have the, the symbol for July 18th, even if it was on some other day. But I take the position that they start on the first day of the first month with this 180 days. That is, they're counting that 180 days as, as that period of time, that new year, right? So it's a new year. Um, and it's going to be the third year of Xerxes. Okay. Now, um, now we have some other dates. So when we get to the seventh year, and one of the things you can see, it's the third year of Xerxes, right? So when we move along here, I'm just going to go. Um, oops, what am I doing? Okay, I wanted to do years. Uh, here. Okay, so the next event is going to be in the seventh year of Xerxes. What am I doing? What am I doing? Okay, so this is going to be the year, and it's going to be the tenth month. Right, so we have to go here to the 10th month. Okay, so when you get to uh, the seventh year of Xerxes in the 10th month, that's when Esther is going to be crowned. Now, um, so in, let's take a look at that here in chapter two. So we, we'll come back to this plot again, but I just wanted to review this calendar stuff. So in chapter two, they're going to have this, um, all of these maidens coming together and she's going to be chosen, right? And then it says, now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, this is 12, uh, 2 verse 12. After that, she had been 12 months according to the manner of women. For so were the days of their purifications accomplished to it six months with oil and myrrh, six months with sweet odors and with other things for purifying of the woman. Thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given to her to go to go with her out of the house of the woman unto the king's house. And in the evening she went and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the woman uh, to the custody of Shazgaz, the king, king's chamberlain, right? And then now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abigail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the woman appointed, and Esther obtained the favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto the king Ahasuerus into the house royal on the 10th month, which is the month Tebet, in the seventh year of his reign. So, so that would mean that this would have started in the sixth year, right? Because we have one year period. Um, so exactly um, when they started, it doesn't tell us which month they started this, but we would assume it'd be like the ninth or 10th month. Right, that they these women are chosen, uh, and then they have to go through their purification process. Right, and when Esther goes in, she's going to be chosen. Okay, so that means this period of time um, is a period of one year. Right, so after the Persian campaign, and when we looked it up before. Um, I'm just trying to remember. So that's going to be 
Now that's in the year. Uh, Five eighty to five seventy nine, right? So I believe that that's going to end sometime. Um, I'm just looking here on Wikipedia to see when that. Um, so King Xerxes of Persia sought to conquer all Greece. The invasion was direct if delayed response to the defeat of the first Persian invasion uh, at the Battle of the Marathon, which ended Darius's the first attempts to subjugate Greece. So, um, so Darius is going to make an attempt. So it says, after Darius's death, his son Xerxes spent several years planning for the second invasion, mustering an enormous army and navy. The Athenians and Spartans led the Greek resistance. About a tenth of the Greek cities, city-states joined the allied effort. Most remained neutral or submitted to Xerxes. The invasion began in the spring of 580 BC. Um, when the Persian army crossed, and how do you say this? Hellespont? How do you say the name of that? Is it Hellespont? Hellespont. Hellespont and marched through Thrace and Macedon to Thessaly. Anyway, so I'm just going to try to find out exactly when they have this ending. Um, I have a lot of detail. Wikipedia loves these ancient battles. Um, Said 480. Did I say 580? 480 BC. Um, okay, uh, what's the date? Yeah, they don't. Trying to find the end of the war. The spring of 480, they begin this. In August of 480. September 480. Okay, so so this war is going to end um, at the end of 480, the beginning of 479. So <clears throat> so that's going to be. Uh, it's going to end in the early winter. So if uh, Esther, this process here where they gather these women. Um, so if we go to 480, I'm just, I wish I had like a specific date in which this is ended, but they don't. Um, basically, it looks like. Um, you know, so they have some contradictions about exactly. So they, so the, it's over before the winter, right? So uh, by winter you're looking at like November or something like that. So. When you talk about the 10th month on uh, that calendar, so I'm going to switch back to the calendars here. So when we get to this 10th month, you can see uh, in 479, uh, that's December uh, 22nd, right? In 479. And if I go back a year, um, so if we get to the first day of the 10th month, that's going to be the sixth year of Xerxes, right? So that's going to be um, the year in which that war ends. That's going to be January 2nd. 
So if you if you looked at the 10th month, then you're going to have 12 months in that year. So when you get to um, the December, that's going to be the end. So so sometime before January 2nd, that war is going to end, and probably a month or so before. So maybe the end of November. Um, so that gives them time to go back uh, to Persia. And um, obviously all the troops wouldn't be back by then, but definitely uh, Xerxes would be back at that time. So basically as soon as he gets back, they're going to start this process of finding him a new wife. So, so we've looked at this before, but that fits in with this timeline that I have here. So the Persian campaign against Greece, you can see here at the bottom, that's going to be the, in the sixth year of Xerxes. So it's going to start in the spring, and then it's going to end before the end of the year. So it's going to be in this period of time, that, that one-year period, in which uh, they're going to choose these women. And Esther is going to be the one ultimately chosen, and it's going to be sometime in the 10th month in the seventh year. So not, not necessarily the first day of the 10th month, but it's going to be in the 10th month. It could be near the end of the 10th month. So it could be, it could be somewhere in January of uh, 478 BC. Okay. So, so we can look at these dates. We can see that they're grounded in history. And uh, you know one of the uh, one of the issues about that scholars have to face is here you have a book, the Book of Esther, that they claim was written in the second century BC. So they don't take it as a a true book, right? It's just it's just a story, and uh, somehow there's there's a Greek version of it that's longer than the Hebrew version. Um, and they don't really have a good explanation for that. Uh, mostly what they think is the Greek version adds things to a Hebrew version, but it's not, not really very logical based on their argument. Um, it would make more sense that the Hebrew was actually uh, a, a redaction of, of the Greek. Um, you know, because if they believe that it was created in the, the second century BC, it wouldn't really make sense that they had this Greek version or a Hebrew version, and then somehow they added a whole bunch of stuff in the Greek. It, ju it just doesn't really make any sense. There's no consistency in their argument. Um, but the fact is, they wouldn't have been able to create this book to fit history in this way. Now they have arguments about, well, the queen's name, um, but the thing is people had lots of different names and different titles, plus you're dealing with um, uh, to know the names of some of these people. We're dealing with um, books that were written long after the fact, giving attributing names to different people. And, um, and so you have Persian names, you have Hebrew names, all those types of things. So it, there isn't some clear-cut way in which uh, they can explain the Book of Esther. So we know the Book of Esther was written and, and, and gives us real history, written at the time. Okay, somebody have a comment? Okay, I just heard a sound. Okay, so, so Esther, Esther becomes queen, and then we're going to have this story that we were addressing before which was this plot now as far as this plot is concerned um and, and we had discussed this when the virgins were gathered together so as a symbol um we can relate this to the parable of the ten virgins right and and we also looked at the second time well we know in early writings, Ellen White's going to quote uh, uh, or paraphrase Isaiah 11, 11, right? 
which is going to talk about the Lord stretching out his hand to recover a second time. Um, let me see if I can find it here in early writings. Um, So this is that section here. I'll show you this. <clears throat> so remember when we looked at early writings, page 74, and it says September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he stretched out his hand a second time to the recover, recover the remnant of his people. Now, what, what month or is this uh, vision shown? So it says September 23rd. Is that correct? Uh, you said it was October 23rd. It's October 23rd, right? So we have this error that creeped in uh, to early writings, page 74. And the reason it did, the conclusion uh, that we came to, is that we know that Ellen White had this vision on October in uh, 23rd, not September 23rd, right, in 1850. Uh, because we have the account of this vision, um, and we clearly know where it was given. It was given at... Uh, uh, brother uh, um, can't think of his name Howland. This, um, is it Howland no it's not not Howland um, I'll have to look it up again um, uh, let me see here I'll find this paper real quick Yeah, so, um, yeah, so it's going to be at, um, um, I have this listed here. Brother Nichols, that's where it is. So it's Brother Nichols' house, right? And 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 we have the vision and where it's given. Now, how did this creep into uh, early writings with a wrong month? What's what's the theory behind that? Why does it say September 23rd instead of October 23rd? Okay, so why? Because James, one is, James White is the editor of The Present Truth, which is this um, publication, volume one, right, number... 11. So why does he get the month wrong? So when he collects these uh, these visions and puts it in there, one of the visions is in September. And and often what they would do in those days is they would um, they wouldn't put the month. They would use this abbreviation um, I N S T period, which means like instant 
which means in this month. And, and my theory is that originally that's what she wrote in the letter when she's giving this account. Now, so James White would look at this and he would just think this is in September because these were put together from a, a number of letters. And so we just simply put September 23rd. Now, what's the significance of this being September 23rd in this early writings, but being October 23rd in reality? Why is this significant? Okay, so any any idea of why this is significant? So we found this. We found that it's October 23rd. But why is this significant? Do we not remember this study? I know this was a long time ago. This this was we were studying. This is of course the section where it talks about they had a correct view of the gate daily, right? And also the situation with Sister Minor. So why why did this wrong date creep in, and why did we find it and correct it? So what's this? What's that, Dwight? And I remember us discussing this. I just don't remember all the details. Okay. So what's the significance of September 23rd as a date? It represents 9.3. Okay. So we know that September was originally the seventh month, right? Correct. That's what, September. So it's a symbol of 273. All right. Okay. Now, Angela looks at um, Revelation 9. Is that what you were? Um, Re Revelation 12. 923 prophecy of Hiram Edson's October 23, 18.44. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand your what you wrote there. What's 9.23 refer to? Uh, I was referring to the 9.23 idea of, you know, the, the Virgin, the Jupiter, and all those those, those those planets, and I was comparing that that to the vision on uh, on October twenty third, eighteen forty four. Okay. The true and and the false, so to speak, or what the world believes and what was revealed to the Lord's movement. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know. So obviously, it's October twenty third. So it's hidden. So first thing we could say is that Ellen White has this date. And it's going to be uh, an anniversary because it's going to be in 1850. It's going to be six years to the day from Hiram Edson's Cornfield Vision. Okay. But it's going to be written as September 23rd. Now, in 1844, so we'll look at a couple of things. In 1844, September 23rd was actually the date that the Jews kept as the 10th day of the seventh month. Right. Both the rabbinic and the Karaite Jews observed September 23rd as the Day of Atonement in 1844. Now, so that's one significance of that date. We also can see that it symbols 273, the 23rd day of the seventh month. Right. And, and in America, it wasn't until 1758 uh, that they changed the first month to January. Right. 
So they used to have the first month basically was March, right? So September would be the seventh month earlier on. Um, so we, we know that we have that symbol of 273. Um, we also have September 23rd, uh, 2017. So September 23rd, 2017, 777 days before November 9th, 2019. Well, that's going to be me at Lambert Church giving the symbol of July 18th. So September 23rd um, always has stood out in my mind because of early writings, page 74. Right. Long before I was even in this movement, I always noted that date because it's one of the few ones where it really stands out in the spirit of prophecy. She gives a date. But to find out it was actually October 23rd, um, this was part of a detailed study in understanding uh, Ellen White's statement in early writing 74. We spent a lot of time doing it and I wrote a paper on it. Um, but it has the symbol of 273. It ties us to the 777 structure. And um, it also deals with something that is similar to uh, our history, right? That is, the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of, hand of the Lord. There was a mistake in it, and that mistake was hid. And then God's hand was removed. And, and so you can see that relates specifically to September 23rd as well. Because don't we see a mistake? And God's hand is being removed for us to see that it's actually October 23rd. Does that make sense to people, what I'm saying? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So there's, there's something here for us to see in this early writings, page 74, that only we seem to have noticed. Now, I wrote a, a letter to the LNG White Estates, and I sent it through the official channels of how you're supposed to do that. They have never responded. Now, uh, there was a scholar who has written books on Ellen White who did uh, read my paper on academia and wrote me a letter and said that he noticed that the vision must be on October 23rd. So he had noticed that as well. So he, but, but the E.G. White Estates doesn't seem to care about it, that there is this mistake in early writings. Now, it's not Ellen White's mistake. It's not like she, she wrote the wrong month in which her vision occurred. But it's just, it crept in through um, the article that James White wrote, and it continued to be copied as this mistake. And so we've corrected it. So we have a correction of a mistake, and it, it parallels the, the topic of this chapter. <clears throat> now, we're looking at this because we're talking about Isaiah 11.11 that Ellen White's quoting. Right. So to get back to uh, to the scripture itself uh, that we're looking at in uh, Esther. So we're saying that these virgins are gathered a second time. Right now, and this is going to be in connection with a plot. And, and Mordecai is going to discover this plot. Right. He's going to uncover it and not on purpose, just by accident, basically overhear something and he's going to report it. And that then is going to be um, brought up later on when, the, when Xerxes is going to be looking through uh, the, the record books of these events. OK. So it says, when the virgins were gathered together the second time. So that reminds us of Isaiah 11.11, 11, right? So in, in early writings, page 74, when we deal with this, uh, the Lord um, 
Show me he stretched out his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people. Uh, Ellen White's going to explain what she meant. Right? People are familiar with that. So she says here, uh, so I'll go back here. Um, so this is in early writings. This is an explanation of that statement. She says, as I have given a brief sketch of my experience and views published in 1851, it seems to be my duty to notice some points in that little work. Also, I give more recent views. So, so originally, this was this art, this vision was published in the present truth, and then it was published in 1851 in the book called Experience and Views. And Experience and Views was later used uh, in compiling early writings. So this is in early writings. And she's going to give an explanation um, of this. And I think this is the one. Uh, so there's on page. Okay. Um, it's going to be here. Um, this one, point number three. The view that the Lord had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people on page 74 refers only to the union and strength once once existing among those looking for Christ and to the fact he had begun to unite and raise up his people again. Now, now why is she giving this explanation? So the second time is referring to when in this context. Because we know what it applies to originally in uh, in Isaiah, it's going to apply to the history that we see in the three decrees and so forth, because it's comparing basically the, the captivity coming out of Egypt to the captivity coming out of Babylon, right? That's what Isaiah 11.11 is referring to. But here, Ellen White is applying it to what? What's the second time? What's the first time? So the first time would be Millerite history, correct? And the second time is that history that Ellen White was in, in 1850. Is that, is that how people understand it? That's how I understand it. If nobody's saying anything, I'll take your si silence as agreement. Okay, so when we go back to Esther again, and we're making an application, we're going to say that the virgins were gathered together the second time. Can we take this statement and apply it to what Ellen White says? Can we look at Millerite history as the first time? and is the second time as our history. Uh, I think we have to, but there's so much to ponder here. Yeah, there's lots to ponder. So so we could just take it as we have Millerite history, and now we're applying it to our history. Now, Mordecai discovers a plot. Now, so in understanding this plot, I say, well, could this be the plot to blow up Nashville, to do a nuclear attack on Nashville? Could that be the plot that's uncovered? And so we ask questions about, well, who is Mordecai in this narrative, this part? Um, 
you know, what part does Esther have to play? Um, you know, what specifically is this plot? And then, you know, could we apply this even in our history as a repeat? That is, could we have a first time, you know, having to do with um, this movement in its earlier history in some way, and then a second time being a later history? So now we know that this plot is uncovered at this time, but the other thing is that the reward for this is going to happen in a later history, right? So Mordecai is going to uncover this plot. Um, it's going to be uh, written in the book of the Chronicles before the king, right? And later on, this is going to be read. And this is going to be read at a time when Haman is plotting to uh, to bring about an end to the Jews. Now, we also talked when we studied this before, is that, is it possible that Haman was actually even involved in this original plot? I mean, there's two people that are going to be punished in this. Um, so we had some speculation, I guess you could call it, upon uh, what part Haman had to play. Now, there's lots of different things about Haman, um, uh, different applications that we can make of him. Right? So there's different ways in which we could apply this story, because in some ways we could say there's a, yeah, there's a parallel between uh, Haman and, and Parminder. You know, if this is the case, because in a sense, there was Parminder had a plot to overthrow uh, Jeff and so forth. So we could make other kinds of applications. But here we have this really specific reference, the gathering of the second time. And, and here we have the virgins. So we can definitely apply this to Millerite history and to our history in some way. But we have a plot that's uncovered. But. The reward is going to be given later in connection with the Sunday law. And so is it possible that what happened with July 18th can later be recognized by Xerxes? And that that's going to bring honor to this movement that originally uncovered this plot. So I'm putting that out for consideration. An interesting premise. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, so, so it's definitely a possibility. Now, now in this story, we can see Xerxes in, is involved in both cases. So, if Xerxes is Trump, you know, the question is: Is this going to be Trump again? Who is going to recognize this so we don't know right at, at this point because we still have some things that we have to lay out but it is it is sort of tempting to see this in some way that that originally trump would know about this he would know there was a prediction about july 18 2020 there was an inquisition made into the into the matter. The people who were involved in this plot against Nashville were found out, and there was a record made in, you know, the the record of the president of the United States. In this case, if we're taking this story just as this illustration, so we have Xerxes as Trump, but later Xerxes is going to refer back to this record and and it's going to be at a time in which these things are actually happening right so maybe at the time when nashville is actually bombed we don't know right so so we're, we're but but there is a way in which this makes sense So, so this would agree with the idea that maybe that Trump is going to become president again and is involved 
is president at the time that Nashville is bombed. So it's an idea, right? So, so we need to keep that in mind. And we have, of course, at that time, it's going to be in connection with the Sunday law, right? Because it's going to be in connection with Haman um, uh, bringing about this decree. You know, yeah. I, I, I appreciate the fact that we're investigating this. Mm -hmm but I'm still having a lot of heartburn over the idea of a Trump being a literal symbol of this mm -hmm. B Trump becoming again, the, or becoming as Colin was trying to point out Alexander the great. Right. So, so there, there's, we have some, some points. See, then that's where I can't accept at this point that Alexander the Great represents, uh, Trump in any way, whether it has to do with, you know, Greece in some way, having to do with the speed and so forth. But we're going to examine those things. Well, um, but the thing that I'm saying here is we, we, we need to at least look at this and examine it. But I still think that when we when we go through and examine this that we will see because my argument always was is it doesn't need to be trump because trump fulfilled the role that that he was given in our line that is on january 6 2021 what we had said about trump is he's going to be the last president he's the last republican president right so he's going to be the 19th republican president we also know that ted wilson the idea that he's the 20th uh, um, president of the General Conference. Of course, we're doing the count kind of different. You know, we don't count every time somebody becomes uh, president again, you know, as a new number. We're just numbering them. And, and these are going to parallel with Judah and Israel, the 20 kings of Judah and the 19 kings of northern Israel. And in northern Israel, we're going to discount one of them too, because there's actually 20. But that's a whole other story. The point is we have this 19 and this 20. It is fulfilled on January 6, 2021. And the view that we have is that this is typical of something else. Now, we use Trump in a, in a, in a sort of this one-for-one one parallel with Xerxes in that history. The question is, are we still going to continue in this later history uh, to, ex to say that Xerxes is Trump, or does it change into something broader, right, than Trump? That is just basically the Republican uh, Party, whoever that person happens to be at the time, right? So those are some of the questions that we have to answer. But right now we're looking at this in this sort of broad, objective way, and because in order to examine things properly, we have to we have to look at all the possibilities. So we, the point is, I can see how someone would say, well, Xerxes is Trump. And so Xerxes is Trump through this whole story in the book of Esther. But remember, we have this same situation with the king of the north and the king of the south. Right. So when we examined um, the foundation of Adventism. And we saw a mistake that the Millerites made. The mistake specifically was when they dealt with the king of the north and the king of the south in Daniel chapter 11, they continued to take the idea that it was the territory that was occupied that determined who was the king of the north and who was the king of the south. Right. So when they get to Daniel chapter 11, so let's just quickly go there and they're going to be reading about the king of the north and the king of the south. They're going to be these powers that occupy these places. So Syria and that area, that's going to be, you know, that's the Seleucid Empire's area. So Turkey is going to be the king of the north. And then Egypt, well, that's the king of the south. And so 
when they get to uh, chapter 40, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south, south push at him? Well, they're saying, well, the king of the south is pushing at him. Well, the king of the south is Egypt. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. So they're saying the hymns are France. The king of the south, Egypt. The king of the north, Turkey. That's what they say. That's the view Uriah Smith has regarding um, Daniel 11, verse 40, right? The king of the north and the king of the south. Now, James White has a different view. He says in verse 36 that the king that shall, shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, is the papacy where uh, the pioneers and Uriah Smith say this is France. They think this is talking about an atheistic power. Yet the language here is the language we always have about the papacy. We can look at Second Thessalonians. We can look at uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7, right? Daniel chapter 8, right? This is the papacy. But at this point here, they're going to say, well, the king of the north is going to be Rome. But when we get here, all of a sudden it changes to the king of the north. Um, oh, pardon me. Let me see how they go through. So it's talking about the king of the north being the papacy. But when we get to verse 36, it's no longer talking about the same person. Yet Uriah Smith says when it's, if it said a king, then it would be introducing a new person. But it doesn't say a king. It says the king. So, so the king that's being talked about is this king here that is the papacy, right? So the papacy is going through this, this whole history. And so when the king of the south comes against him, uh, the king of the south is coming against this one that has just been mentioned, which is the papacy. It's not the, the one that's just been mentioned is not France, right? So, so the mistake that they make, though, is what? What is the specific mistake that they're making, like from a principal point of view, that they that they ignore? Because they're not following Miller's rules. And which rule are they not following? Okay, how do we distinguish between spiritual and literal? By application. Okay, so, so we have a biblical principle first, that first which is literal and that which is spiritual, right? So first literal, then spiritual. What is that principle? That literal figure or literal presentations can then become figurative presentations. Yeah. And, and we sometimes just say before the cross, literal, after the cross, spiritual, which is um, right. Okay. So, so now Miller doesn't say that specifically, um, but he does talk about to know whether we have a true historical event for the fulfillment of prophecy. Um, you have to look for all of them, all of the, the details. And then he also talks about, um, to learn the true meaning of figures, trace your figure, figurative word throughout your Bible and where you find it explained, put it on your figure. And if it makes good sense, you need to look no further. If not, look again. So, for instance, 
When we talk about Babylon in the book of Revelation, are we talking about Iraq? Not at this time. Well, in the book of Revelation, every time Babylon's mentioned, it's not talking about Iraq. And why is it? Why, why is it now a figure or a symbol of something where you can talk about Babylon, you know, in the book of Daniel, and it's talking about Babylon? So what, what's happening there? Why do we know it's a figure in the book of Revelation? Does Babylon exist in the context where the book of Revelation is talking about Babylon? Does it exist as a nation? No, right? Because it fell in 539 BC. So when it's talking about Babylon, we know it's talking about a figure. Does Greece exist as the king of the north and the king of the south in after 1798? No. No. So, and one thing we would look at, if we're going to look at paganism and papalism, the cross for there is 538. Paganism is no more. Papalism is what takes over. So if you're going to be looking at the history after 1798, or in that history of 1798, anything after 538, and it's going to talk about the king of the north and the king of the south, it can't be talking about the literal king of the north and the literal king of the south in the context of Greece. Because paganism has come to an end. We've already been told that in 1131. Um, they shall take away the daily and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. So if that's already happened, that's the center of this satanic covenant week, right? This 25, 20 years divided into two periods of three and a half right? 1260, 42 months. And um, so when we're talking here in verse 40, we have to be talking about the king of the south in a, in a figurative sense. And that's going to be Sodom and Egypt. That's going to be France. The king of the north has to be the papacy because the transition has already happened here. When you start to get to 31, we see this is the rise of the papacy, right? And so this is going to be uh, the history coming up to the papacy. And so when the king shall do according to his will, that's the papacy. It's not a new king. It's not the king of France. You know, it's not, not France involved here. This is the papacy. And this is describing the papacy. But the papacy is going to be set up by France. And it's going to be taken down by France. <clears throat> so when we look at our history, can we be making the same mistake in applying these symbols? Like, So when we look at, at Xerxes as being Trump, we know that he is. But is Xerxes always a symbol of Trump? Or can Xerxes be a symbol of something else? Because part of the thing that people have said is, as a criticism, well, how do you get from it being about a person to being about a system? Well, quite simply, because that's what happens in scripture all the time. And when we have made this application within our lines, within that 777, structure um, we had this happen 
for this movement to be typical of something. In a sense, it's a more literal representation of that history of Daniel 11, verse uh, 2, right? So Daniel 11, verse 2, where we have this list of these kings. In verse 3, we now have a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So one thing you can see here is a direct parallel to 11, verse 31, right? Right, so he's going to do according to his will. So when you get to 11, verse 31, it says, um, uh, when it talks about this here, um, oh, pardon me, 36, I meant, um, the king shall do according to his will. So can you see the parallel here between the papacy and Alexander? Right? You, you see the parallel. Yeah, so Rand just points us to uh, rule number 10. Uh, figures sometimes have two or more different significations as a day is used in a figurative sense to represent three different, different periods of time. So that's true. Um, rule 11, how to know when a word is used figuratively, if it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, if not figuratively. Right. So there's lots of different rules about how to understand figurative and literal. Right. But the point that I'm making here, do you, do you see the point that uh, we have the same transition when we go from verse 2 to verse 3 that we get connected with verse uh, 36. That verse 36 is talking about the papacy. And that Alexander in type is a type of the papacy. Do people see what I'm saying? Okay, so Iran says yes. So, so we have that same sort of break, right, from talking about Xerxes as Trump, but now we have a mighty king that rides up. That's the next thing. And so we could take this as, you know, something that's future, obviously, from Xerxes, from Trump, uh, but it's going to be addressing that uh, union, right? Now, there's a number of things, you know, when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. Now, in, in trying to apply this to the United States, what would be the problem here if we're going to take that this is just even the United States? Mighty king shall stand up, and when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. So we, we've often tried to apply this to what's going to happen. You know, national apostasy is followed by national ruin. So, so... So let's look at these verses, and we'll come back to Esther here. But let's just read this. Um, and a mighty king shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So it has things that would parallel it to the papacy. I'm not saying it's just directly the papacy. But it says, and when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others besides those. So we know this refers to Alexander, 
but we're saying he's a type of something that's going to come, right? We can look at the historical fulfillment in order to understand how we would reply, apply the repeat of this history. The king of the south shall be strong. So the king of the south, this is actually the kingdom is divided, and the king of the south is going to be strong. That's going to be Egypt and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter, uh, this is Berenice, of the south shall come up to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up. And they that brought her and he that begat her and he that strengthened her in these times. Right. And then it says, but out of the branch of his roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them and shall prevail. Right. So one of the things we see here is we see the things in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45 are going to continually be repeated. And we're going to have this king of the north and this king of the south conflict. Now, this literally is fulfilled with Egypt and and Syria, right? But we look at the fulfillment of these prophecies and we apply it to the end of the world. That is, we don't apply these prophecies directly. We look for the historical fulfillment and these historical fulfillments are going to be repeated, right? So when Ellen White talks about uh, the book of Daniel is going to be repeated. She doesn't really say that, but she doesn't even say really the book of Daniel or chapter 11 is going to be repeated, though we we accept that that's what she's talking about because she's going to say the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. What history is she saying that's going to be repeated? What prophecy? What prophecy is going to be repeated that she specifically refers to? You know, she says, study Revelation in connection with Daniel, for history, history will be repeated. I'm just trying to find the actual one statement. I can't find it. How's, I can't remember the exact wording. But she's referring to Daniel 11, verse 36 and on, right? Are people familiar with that statement? Um, she's going to talk about in connection with uh, Daniel chapter 3. Um, so we know Daniel chapter 3 is going to be repeated. Okay, so this is the one that I'm looking at. Um, the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do and he shall re even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So she's going to actually quote verses 30 to 36. So verses 30 to 36, Ellen White specifically marks as that um, much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy, Daniel 11, and then she quotes 30 to 36. So when she talks about it being repeated, she's, she doesn't say everything in Daniel 11 is going to be repeated. 
you know, all the history. But she says much of it is going to be. And she specifically quotes 30 to 36. So, uh, or, so 30 to 36 is addressing what? As we, we know, 30 to 36 is addressing the rise of the papacy, right? The, the papacy moving from pagan Rome to papal Rome. Or, or, or the Rome moving from pagan to papal. Is that correct? Is that how you understand Daniel 11, 30 to 36? That this is, this is the transition from pagan to papal Rome. We could go through all this. It's going to deal with pagan Rome, but ultimately it's bringing us to papal Rome. Right? So it's going to talk about, you know, 30 is going to talk about Anthony and Egypt. Um, when you get to 31, um, this arm shall stand on his part. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. She'll take away the daily. Right. So we can see that that's the transition from pagan to papal Rome. OK, so if that's the case. If we take uh, the history that's going to be repeated in our history. Can we see that there is a transition that happens? That we have a transition. From, from things that are, we're dealing with Trump as a person, but we then know that it moves in verse 3. It's going to move to this, this mighty king that shall stand up. And if we understand that that's a parallel to the papacy, this is going to be uh, the Sunday law, but it's a new power. Right. That is, it's not it's not Persia. It's now Greece. Now, Greece is going to to be constantly repeating um, this king of the north, the king of the south thing. And it's going to be illustrating. The Sunday law at the end of the world, what's going to happen? Greece is going to do that. Rome is going to do that. This, this is how I understand Daniel 11 in, in applying it here. It's going to have these different sections, and each of these sections is, is a history, a prophecy, but it becomes a history, and that history is illustrating the end of the world in different ways and different aspects. And so to me, it doesn't make sense to say, when a mighty king shall stand up, it needs to be a person. Because one thing is it's the same transition that we see with um, Daniel 11, verse 36. We now have the papacy. And so this mighty king standing up is now illustrating not a person, but a system. Any thoughts on that? You know, you guys aren't really cooperating too much. Iran types things. Okay, so let's go back to Esther. Because we've taken a bit of a detour. But what we have to say about this plot is that in the first three chapters, we have an illustration of the first, second, and third angel's message. We're going to see that that's paralleling our history. The first angel's message, 
That's the church that's called but refuses. That would refer to the history from 1989 to 9-11. Esther chapter 2 is going to illustrate the history from 9-11 prior to the Sunday law itself, right? And in that history, we're going to see this story of this plot that Mordecai discovers. And, and we're, we're, this movement is really about the second angel's message. Now, we know, of course, the second angel joins with the third and empowers it, right? Because that's the Sunday law history. But our movement is about the Sunday law. So it's about the second angel that joins with the third and gives it power. And so our movement right now is involved in, in this. And we have discovered a plot. And that plot was recorded. However, we look at that. In some ways, we know that the United States uh, intelligence understood this prediction. Okay, so Angela asks a question. Uh, what do I think of Norman McAlty's Ellen White's interpretive roadmap on Daniel 11? Well, I haven't read it or seen it or whatever. I guess that must be a sermon. Well, I'm not a fan of Norman McNulty. I don't think he knows anything. Um, so what is it that he says? Angela, if I'm if I'm going to have to. I just, I just found it myself, so I was just skimming through it. I, I can send it to you if you want. Yeah, or you can look it up. Wonderful. But I mean, okay. I've had questions with Norman McNulty. He, he's he's not he, any of his ideas are not really very sound. Now, I mean, I could go into detail, but basically, I mean, he rejects the twenty five twenty, and his reasons for doing so are really um, more than weak. I mean, they're just not honest is probably the best way to say it. So he, he's not honest in his attack of the 2520. Um, well, who I can be? What's that? <laughs> I said, who can be? I mean, if you start to look at it, you'll see it sound if you're willing to receive it. Right, yeah. But also I know that his understanding of Daniel 11 isn't anything like ours. I, I've seen his attack on Jeff's understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Um, but that was a long time ago. I don't remember all the details of it. Uh, but he definitely doesn't in, uh, accept our interpretation um, of that. So, but anyway, so let's go back here. We got we got these these verses before us. We can say that these virgins gathering together a second time at least refers to this movement, this history, the parable of the ten virgins will be repeated, has been fulfilled, been fulfilled and will be repeated to the very letter, right? So we believe that we're in the being the repeated to the very letter, parable of the ten virgins. And so we can apply that gathering the second time to our history. What it actually means in the story of Esther, I'm, I'm not certain, right? I don't know what it means when the virgins were gathered together the second time. Different people have different theories, but it doesn't really matter in this application. We can just see the symbols that apply to our movement. Now then it says, Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her. Now, how would we apply this as a symbol? And like, who is Mordecai and who is Esther? I think Esther definitely needs to be a message. And Mordecai would represent uh, this movement in some way. And, and remember, we have these... Um, these two uh, chamberlains, um, 
Now, big thin means in uh, in their wine press, and terish means strictness. Now, um, Angela, I think you had said that big thin represents gift of God or something. Yeah, I found that, but I don't know the language, so I'm just taking what you know the, the Bible tools or whatever it is says, throwing it yeah. out there. Yeah, I'm not sure how you would get the gift of God from Big Ten, but obviously it's a Persian name. It's not not Hebrew. I mean, uh, gift of God uh, would be um, like El Nathan, or because Natan means gift and El means God. Um, so I'm not really sure. Um, how how you would get gift of God there. But but anyway, so uh, so we have these two. Um, now, so why is there two, Big Thin and Terish? So I'm going to take the meaning as being uh, in their wine press. So in the wine press. And strictness. So can it be that these this plot is uncovered through studying God's word in strictness? And that it's doubled. Um, because it's certain, and there are two witnesses, that is, Ezekiel and um, the prophecy of Josiah, and Revelation 9, Josiah Lich's prophecy. So would that refer to that? Because in bringing those things out, we had two witnesses for July 18, and it's done through the wine press and strictness, that is, I can think of nothing that I've ever studied that had so much detail. And and when you think about the wine press as grapes being pressed, um, definitely the effort that was placed into establishing those, the chronology, all the background information that was needed to come with the July 18, 2020 uh, prediction, not just by me personally, but even by this movement in general. Um, that's how it is discovered. Does that make sense? Yes, so this makes a lot. Yeah. Okay. And then this thing is known to Mordecai, to this movement, but he tells it unto Esther the queen. And Esther certified the king whereof thereof in Mordecai's name. So we would need to know. So if it's this movement, uh, Esther the queen, we're not looking for a person. We're looking at a some kind of message. So there's something about Esther uh, that certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. So we would need to know what that was about. And then there's going to be this inquisition of the matter. It's found out, and then the ones who reveal this plot are hanged on a tree, right? So that is, there is people responsible. So we're, I don't know, if we're mixing metaphors here a little bit, um, but we can see that the symbols here, what does it mean to be hanged on a tree? According to the Bible. It's the curse. It's the curse of God. He's that is hung on a tree is the curse of God, right? Okay. Now this also would refer to the cross of Christ. So even though we we have it here, there's this inquisition. 
uh, this would refer to a type of persecution in some ways. So, you know, so we, we our time is up, but we, we'll come back to this point uh, tomorrow and, and try to finish this, this section off, uh, Esther 2 and then Esther 3 maybe. Okay, so let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, uh, please be with us through the rest of this day and bring us together to study your word according to thy will. Thank you for the time that we have had here and the things that we have seen. And we pray for your wisdom and understanding in these matters. Uh, be with each person who is searching out these things. May your Holy Spirit bring conviction and power to their lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>